Praise God. Well, I want to encourage your walk with the Lord again tonight. Looking at the message of faith. You know what? What God has said in his word is that only those who have faith are even allowed into his presence. We read over in Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11 and verse 6, but without faith, but with, it doesn't say without something else, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must have faith, must believe that he is, and that he is, he must believe again, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So are we just saying that God is holy and he tells us to be holy? Well, he wants us to be like him. And God is a God of faith. He spoke the worlds into existence. He just believed them into existence. Everything we see, verse 3, was made out of nothing. That is, God didn't use some pre-existing material to create the world, but he spoke the world into existence by faith. These people in Hebrews 11, we read of them in verse 13, these all died in faith. And we read of them in verse 39, and these all obtained a good report through faith. And these all obtained a good report through faith. Hebrews 11 and verse 39. Well, you know, this is really the faith chapter in the Bible that deals so much with the faith of these people, the faithfulness seen in their lives, because in the Old Testament, the concept of faith or believing God is all wrapped up in the concept of being faithful to the Lord. And one of the most expressive ways that a person uh, demonstrates or that a person is faithful to the Lord is in his faithfulness to trust God. We see and we know many people and many illustrations, many circumstances around us where people have not been faithful in that area, not faithful in the area of faith, faithful in the area of trusting God. But these are the people who will enter the kingdom, Hebrews 11. These are the roll call of faith. These are the ones who have obtained a good report, and they're all the ones who believed God. It's a chapter on faith and a chapter on their faithfulness and a chapter on some of the extremes of their lives. They all did something by faith. A chapter on the actions that correspond to their faith. They all did something. Almost every verse is by faith someone did something or said something or went somewhere. It's always by faith they're active. Their faith was an active faith. They didn't just sit and deceive themselves as James tells us over in the <coughs> next book in the Bible here saying, well, I have faith. I have faith and you have works and James says well demonstrate your faith without your works you can't is his meaning and he goes on to say I'll demonstrate my faith by my works these people didn't sit there and say I have faith I have faith I believe God they did something about it and as a result God met them in some very miraculous ways and I think one thing that's demonstrated here in Hebrews 11 since it tells us the Old Testament story and the same is seen in Jesus life and the life of the Apostles in the early church is that really it's at the point of sometimes what we hear expressed as man's extremity, the very point of man's extreme where he really needs God and must have a miracle where God's miracle power is given because God receives such glory through that all that a person has come to the very end or there's nothing more they can do or there's nothing they can do even in the first place. Take Israel trying to escape their... Uh, taskmasters in Egypt. There's nothing really that they can do there. And it's all by faith. Uh, too often, I'm afraid, the faith of Moses and Aaron and some others and not the faith of all the Israelites, but it still was by faith. It was all by faith, and as a result, it was all by miracles God. that God Amen. delivered those people. Amen. And, you know, after they came out of that, there's a verse over in Exodus 18. I believe it's verse 11 in Exodus 18 where Moses has uh, escaped the uh, Egyptians and he's um, now talking with his father-in-law Jethro and his father-in-law Jethro around verse 11 in Exodus 18 has this to say now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods for in the thing wherein they dealt proudly he was above them you know what he did he took the very things that the Egyptians trusted in you study the ten plagues or the ten strokes against the nation of Egypt Oftentimes, it was against things that represented idols to them. Take the Nile River. That was the very source of their life there. In the things wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. 
That was the very source of their light. And he took the great mighty Nile River and turned it to blood. Amen. And Jethro said, now I know. Not that you can't know before. He doesn't mean that. But, but now I have more than a theoretical knowledge of this. And that's what Hebrews 11 is teaching here. These people had more than a theoretical knowledge. In other words, they had more than the ability to quote verse 1 of this chapter. They lived that verse. That wasn't an abstraction to them. Well, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Not something that they would theorize about and discuss and memorize and not do anything about. So Jethro is not saying, I didn't believe that God was high above all gods before this happened, but now I know it. You know what he's talking about. There is a sense in which you know something. Yeah that you know it. There's a sense in which you can trust or believe or assume or suppose or reliably guess, but there's a sense in which you can know that this is true. Jethro, now I know that he's a God above all gods because in the very things they took their glory and their power in, whether it was the, the frogs or whatever they worshiped that, or the fish and, or the alligators and all the things that were, or the crocodiles that were killed here in the Nile River. God took all of that and turned that to blood. Now I know, now I know that God is above all gods. He's higher than all gods. What do you think is going through the mind of these people here in Hebrews 11 as they're experiencing these trials of their faith and they're seeing the victory at the end? But now I know. Amen. That he's above all God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One of the examples we looked at last time was Abraham with his child. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Amen. Romans 4. Surely as that comes to a head and a conclusion, it takes time for him to be developed and his faith to be developed. But he's believing. The whole time he's got faith, he's still believing. And finally he realizes that. Now I know. Now I know that God is a God above all gods. And it wasn't but a chapter later that God said, Now take that son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and go to Mount Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering to me. And Abraham was going to do it. He was going to do it. And what did God say whenever he went right to the last moment there? We're told in a very dramatic account that Abraham took the knife and the knife was lifted to heaven. His son was already tied to the altar. He had asked, oh, Father, you know, here, here's the wood and here are the cords, but where's the offering? And Abraham said, God will supply himself a lamb. God will supply himself a lamb. And God did, that was his faith talking. He didn't see any, he didn't bring any sheep along with him. This was the sacrifice of his own son. God underscores that in the second verse of that chapter, take thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. You know, almost rubbing it into him, reminding him, this is your only, well, he had an Ishmael, but that's not a son, not a son of promise or a son of faith. That's a son after the flesh, Paul tells us. That brought Israel and um, her descent is nothing but problems after that. Take thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. It's not like he was the bad boy or like Abraham didn't love him and would be glad to get rid of him as maybe some parents think of their children, but whom thou lovest and offer him as a sacrifice, a burnt offering on Mount Moriah. And as the knife is in heaven to come down and to plunge into his breast, God says, stop. The angel of the Lord says, stop. And what does he say? Now I know. Well, we're back to that word know there. Didn't God know all along? God knows all things. He knows the end from the beginning. Well, surely God knew, but what he means is now we know through a demonstration. It was theoretical knowledge before, especially to Abraham. Now we know through experience that you love me and you are committed to me above anything and anyone else, above everything and everyone else. Now we know that you are committed to me. I think that that's a type of uh, situation we have he here in Hebrews 11 where faith and faithfulness come together. He doesn't have one without the other. You can't have one without the other. Faith equals faithfulness. If a person is not faithful 
we often speak of it this way, they're not on believing ground. They're not even on believing ground. Now, they can say, I believe, I confess, I have, in Jesus' name. They can say that, but without faithfulness, they're not on believing ground. What does David tell us over in one of the Psalms? But this, Psalm 66, verse 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, if I'm not faithful to the Lord, he doesn't hear me. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. These people in Hebrews 11 had to overcome their trials of faith as well as their trials of faithfulness. Their trials of faithfulness involve consecration to God, involve the deeper life, involve obedience to him. And their trials of faith involve just that. I wouldn't have to describe that until you understand what that is. And so I think what we have with these people in Hebrews 11 is the attitude that I left you with a few weeks ago. We were talking about some of the enemies of faith and one of the first enemies we were discussing was the enemy of unbelief where you find just a number of people, any number of people who have just plain pure, if you can use that word in connection with unbelief, pure unbelief. What do we, what do we say when, you know, we say a certain liquid is, is pure, that this is pure alcohol or pure whatever. We mean it's not been diluted with something else or mixed with something else. That's what unbelief is. It's pure unbelief. It's not mixed with an ounce of faith. You run across people, Jesus did in his life and ministry, the Pharisees and the religious people who simply refused to believe, who refused. They weren't struggling. Now, is he the Son of God, or, or should we allow these mighty works which he is doing testify something to us? Should we trust in him? Should we believe what he has to say? Israel of old was the same way, the wandering in the wilderness or the desert. Numbers chapter 14, pure unbelief. Not wavering, not mixed with a portion of faith or a portion of believing God, but pure unbelief. Contrary to the experience of these people in Hebrews 11, who I think would have thought, as I left you with a few weeks ago, that what God had given them, and I want to stress this again to begin with tonight, what God had given them was the privilege of living by faith. Was the privilege of living by faith. Now, some people really want to avoid the faith walk and the faith life. Because, you know, there are trials or they may get put in a difficult situation or may be embarrassed because they said something was going to happen and, well, what if it doesn't happen? Well, faith believes that you have received. If you have received, then how can you not have it? How can it not happen if you have received? Mark eleven twenty four. believe that you have received and you shall have it. Amen. How can you ever be embarrassed with God? Amen. And after all, you're not the one on the spot. You're not the one on the spot. All you have done is taken God had his word and just agreed with him. That's all you've done. Now, if things don't work out, and you see, we don't have to say that because they will with faith. You're not the one on the spot. All you've said is here's what God has said. Here's what the almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, has said. Here's what he said in his word. Here's what I believe. People will try to talk you out of that, and you just have to refuse to listen to them and refuse to receive that. And I don't mean in some uh, kind of meek, which equals weak fashion, or maybe just kind of a denial by silence. Silence, generally, most people will agree, implies agreement, not denial. Silence implies agreement. You don't say anything, that means you agree. Why don't you say something? You know what the Lord said to us, what he said to his disciples in Matthew 10, whatever you've heard in your ear, and, you know, this message of faith is like something hearing in the ear because you're not hearing it. It's not a loud message, you know, that you just pick up out there in the world. It's a very, very small word. You've got to listen real carefully. You know what I mean? And block out all other noises. What you hear in your ear, it's a small, still voice. It's almost a whisper. Trust me, because the world's not hearing it. It's not going out by a megaphone to the world or to the institutional church out there. But what did Jesus say about that? What you hear in your ear, that shall ye upon the housetops. You just have to let people know, this is where I stand. This is what I believe. You know, whenever I had my trial this past spring with my hands and my face, what I heard, or well, what I knew already, is that if you go through... Well, either a serious, severe 
a burn or a serious severe cold spell they call it frostbite then forevermore after that you'll be sensitive in those parts of your body to you know those extremes well I just said immediately I do not receive that Amen. I do not receive that Amen. whenever God heals he restores Amen. He doesn't leave you half crippled or something. Whenever he heals, he restores. And as a result, I've been playing in the fire since then. And I don't have any pain, in, especially in my left hand that was just burned almost to the bone and the skin was just dangling there. Well, there wasn't any skin. I was burned down to the bone. I'm not sensitive there. When we were at our house a few weeks ago grilling out, I just would reach right down into the fire. It didn't face me at all. Maybe singed a few hairs here or there. But it didn't hurt me at all. There's no, there's no uh, sensation or, or you say, oh, so it's dead. There's no sensation. No, there's feeling there. If you prick it with a pen, you'll feel it all right. But I don't receive that. I just don't, I don't believe that. I don't receive that. I will not accept that. You have to tell the devil that. I will not accept that. Because what he'll get you to do is he'll say, well, all right, well, you know, we'll let you be healed halfway. Or we'll let you have your needs met part of the way. He'll give you just as much as you'll take as long as you'll take the rest of the package, which is always doubt and unbelief, something Amen. negative from him. Remember, he never brings pure uh, deception. He mixes it with truth. Well, he'll give you some truth there, and then he'll mix it with something else. And you have to make a, a bold statement and take a bold stand. I do not accept that. I'll have it all or I'll have it none. I won't have half of this business here Amen. because as surely as we're standing here, the devil will deceive you into accepting half of it, part of it, and not all of it. And that's not God's best. Well, I told you a few weeks ago that ever since I had read on the back of one faith teacher's publications this little statement about God giving him the privilege to live by faith, and i never forgotten that. I just happened to bring one of his books along so I could, I could read it to you here. He's this is on the back of the book, you know, advertising, well, you know, telling something about him, his testimony, his ministry, and the address that you can order the books from. And he had been a, down south, a denominational pastor, a Baptist, I believe, for a few years. And then he had been baptized in the Holy Spirit and healed and given the faith message. And in the second paragraph of this little advertisement on the back of all of his publications, as far as I know, uh, we have this after seven years as a pastor uh, God told him I think he was a Baptist pastor I'm positive that's what he was I know he was a denominational pastor after seven years as a pastor God told him he was giving him the and all of this now is in capital uh, bold letters privilege privilege of living by faith the next sentence so he resigned his pastorate there and started an independent full gospel charismatic work and I guess I I'd heard a lot of teaching about faith or I guess I should say I'd heard some whenever I first heard this brother and his teaching but I never heard faith message like that that this is a privilege you know you find some people who've gotten away from it and who are still hungry for the Lord and they kind of uh, uh, regret the fact that they're not in the faith all the time and exercising their faith it's a privilege to be in that it's a privilege to have opportunities and experiences where your faith can be demonstrated and exercised. There are a whole lot of people who don't have that, a whole lot of people, of course, who don't want that. But there are a lot of people who don't have that. And the, I guess the point he was trying to make here is as a Baptist pastor, you know, you're signed on with a salary and a, you got a meal ticket and the board pays you and all this business and you have your, your uh, income here and there. And God said, I'm going to give you the privilege... <laughs> You know, God's reasoning is just backwards to this world's. I'm going to give you the privilege to give all of that up. You know, you have to ask, am I hearing you right, Lord? Did you say I'm, that you're giving me the privilege of losing all my security? Well, that's what he's saying here. I'm going to give you the privilege. Not all people have this. I'm going to give you the privilege of losing your security, of giving it up. And I'm not going to force it away from you. God could do that, you know, through circumstances, cause you to end up being thrown out or bankrupt or something, so you pretty much either have to trust him or go into the poorhouse. I'm going to give you the privilege of voluntarily turning your back on it and walking away. That's a big step of faith. 
That's a large step of commitment to make right there. You see how faith and faithfulness go together. I'm going to give you the privilege of with your own, with your eyes wide open. You aren't talked out of this or deceived out of it or kicked out of it or forced out of it or blackballed in the Baptist, Southern Baptist Convention. He was on his way to that, I'm sure. But I'm going to give you the privilege of just turning your back on all of that. Well, God gave us that when we moved to Minnesota, the privilege of leaving security. Just the privilege of it all. And we should look at our trials like that. They're trials of faith, but they're trials of privilege as well. Trials of privilege that God just, well, he just doesn't give the average person out there. Why? It'd probably kill them. It probably would. It'd probably literally send them to the grave to have no security and no insurance and no one to depend on and no one to look to, to be totally out on a limb with God wondering, well, what's going to happen if that limb gets sawed off back at the tree? What's going to ha- the trunk? What's going to happen to me out here? You see, a person of faith, he doesn't think that. She doesn't reason that way. She just says, praise God. He says, thank you, Jesus, for the privilege of being out here. You know, whenever we count it that way, and it's not something that you, that you have to conjure up. I guess if you do conjure it up, it's not there. It's just like, you know, just something that's a part of you, that you're so privileged to be able to walk this way, that not everyone gets this. They're tied down here, there. They've got their security with this person or their security with that institution. And, well, you know, you could just take, just not in the financial realm, just take his experience as a religious leader. There's a lot of security being a little, you know, hired underling in the Southern Baptist Convention. All your doctrines already laid out for you. You don't have to study anything or you don't have to, you know, come to grips with things or struggle or wrestle with issues. You just believe what the Baptists teach. You go, you don't have to find your own church. You're appointed to a church. You don't have to start your own. You go through school. He went through seminary. You get your degree and then they just ship you off somewhere. That's easy to experience. I watched that down at seminary. That's easy to experience. You just put all your advertisements up on the little bulletin board in the breeze. We have the seminary there. Here are, here are the, the people looking for, to, to, to go somewhere, and here are the people looking for someone to hire. And all you got to do is get the two together. You always have two bulletin boards. You can go in any seminary, and you'll find them there. There'll be a b- bulletin board of the people advertising, I'm graduating, I'm graduating. Are there any takers out there? <laughs> then there'll be another board over here of churches all over. I saw them anywhere from... Florida to Alaska, literally, I remember those two states, from Florida to Alaska on the bulletin board, advertising, well, we need a a youth leader, or we need a minister of music, or we need a minister of education, or we need a minister of recreation, or we need a part-time singles leader, or we need a, I don't guess any of them were advertising for a full pastorate, but a half (laughs) pastorate, assistant, or whatever they call them, advertising for all of this. And so you go through and you've already, you know, got all types of loans and grants and what have you to get through. And so you're not depending on God. You're not trusting God for that at all. And then you're not trusting him to, to, to show you where to go and to take you there, you know, in some book of accents. It's just, well, I know someone, hey, I've got the supplies and you've got the need, so let's get together here. I've got the degree and you have the need, so let's get together. There's no privilege of living by faith. And if you would try to, you know, talk them into that, well, it's more than they can handle. That's why I say God doesn't give that to many people. I think it would just be more than they could handle. He only gives it to a privileged few. Now, I'm not saying that the rest of the people aren't responsible. They're responsible to God. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin, God said. Whether or not they get anything special from God, any special gift or calling or leading, uh, that's up to God. But whether or not they believe, that's up to them. Whatsoever, whatever is not of faith is sin. Now, I'm not saying that every single situation like I've just described would necessarily be sin. A lot depends on the person's attitude. But I'm just saying I don't think there's even the, uh, the, even the inkling, even the desire, uh, even the uh, guess that that's the way God might want them to operate just to sever all ties, as these people do here in Hebrews 11, and simply trust him. Now, you see, if you're not really in a faith walk, what did we talk about in that last song there? We've been given the privilege to walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Paul said, this is what we do. 
I'm on Paul's side. This is what we do. I include myself in that we. This is what we do. We walk by faith and not by sight. If you're not in that, if you're not experiencing that, then you just don't maybe know what I'm talking about tonight. Of what a privilege it is. Amen. When doors are closed or... Well, there just aren't any doors. There's just a brick wall there. <laughs> Let's face the facts. There aren't windows or doors there. It's just all a dead end. And God makes a way. Amen. Israel's old complaint in the wilderness is, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness in a desert? There weren't any doors or windows that they could see. There were ones from above that they didn't believe in. There weren't any doors. There was a stone wall for them. Can God provide can he prepare a table in the wilderness can god prepare a table in the wilderness what they're asking is can god provide our needs for food in a desert land can god do that same psalm they limited the holy one of israel they limited god they were looking for some earthly doors here god had some heavenly windows to rain down blessings upon them he did it in spite of their unbelief because he did it because of the faith of uh, Moses himself. And God gave them the food of the mighty. He gave them manna from heaven six days a week. Forty years experience of miracles. And they said, can God? Can God? You know, it reminds you of the old devil's question. Well, did God really say that? Can God? Always turning these things around, asking questions of God. Mm -hmm. Faith doesn't put question marks at the end of sentences. Those question marks that exist in your uh, pre-faith life are straightened out to exclamation points whenever you come into the faith walk. Right. Because you have certainty, you have surety in God's word. Right. Abraham being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was also able to perform. Our question marks are straightened out to exclamation points whenever we serve God. Definitely, here's the way that it is. It doesn't matter what people say around me. It doesn't matter if to walk by faith or to live by faith for them is a dreadful thought, a difficult thing. The two things that people in the institutional church hate the most or dread or fear the most Instead of fearing God, the two things they fear the most are, number one, persecution. And they try to avoid that at all cost, generally by being silent. You just, you just don't say anything. You don't give a witness for Jesus. You don't testify to the Lord's word. They're afraid of persecution, and they're afraid of being required to walk by faith and not by sight. I think we can agree on that tonight. Those are the two things most people fear the most. They fear persecution. They fear what their relatives will say. They fear what their employer will say. They fear what their neighbors will say. They fear what former friends or former Christian acquaintances will do to them or say about them or how they will treat them. They fear. Proverbs says the fear of man brings a snare. Amen. The fear of persecution brings a snare. Proverbs 25, 29. Whoever puts his trust in the Lord is safe then. And the second thing they fear is God requiring them to burn their bridges behind them and to simply trust him. You won't ever even know what we're talking about tonight. You won't even be able to appreciate what's being recorded for us here in Hebrews chapter 11 until you know it, until you know it by your own experience. Amen. I don't feel sorry for people when they're in a trial. People don't feel sorry for me. Hey, this works two ways. I don't feel sorry for you either. You should be rejoicing with me and I should be rejoicing with you. Amen. Yeah, count it all joy when you fall into divers' trials, knowing that the trying of your faith works endurance in you. It gives you real knowledge about who God is. Now I know, you can say as old Jethro did, now I know that God is above all gods. For the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he's above them. And all these suggestions and the what ifs and what abouts and be careful of and beware of all of that, he was above them. He did exceeding abundantly above all I could ask or think. He's above all of that. You don't want sympathy in your trials. 
You don't want sympathy. We don't want to feel sorry. I mean, that's like saying, oh, I feel sorry for you. Someone gave you a Cadillac. I, I'm, I'm so sorry that happened. Someone gave you $5,000, you poor thing. You poor thing. No, that's what faith is. It's a privilege. It's a gift to receive. The trials are privileges to go through. I've got to listen to myself as I'm saying this. It's true for all of us here. I think I've told you before, you know, people take me seriously about this. They just, you know, well, he's got faith, so we don't feel sorry for him. We're not worrying about that. I mean, so much so that I say, well, doesn't anybody love me anymore? <laughs> you know? But that's all right. I don't feel sorry for you, so we're equal then. Instead of turn the other cheek, you hit the cheek like they do. No. No, I'm serious about this. We won't go anywhere as God's people if we're always feeling sorry for one another. Oh, we should pray and uphold in prayer and intercede and just encourage and be believing with them. But you know, in most churches, the, the type of counseling you get when you're in a trial is enough to make you give the trial up. Oh, yeah. it's, not, it's not, you know, geared to helping you overcome or see the victory. Somehow, it generally comes across as sympathy sympathy and then you begin feeling yourself other people feel sorry for you I feel sorry we all feel sorry well well then what's the point of even going through this you feel sorry for me that makes me feel sorry for me and I'm sure God feels sorry for me and maybe even the devil is concerned about me today <laughs> so we just don't we want we don't want to go through this anymore for the con you feel sorry for me that makes me feel sorry for me and I'm sure God feels sorry for me and maybe even the devil is concerned about me today <laughs> so we just don't we, won't, we don't want to go through this anymore you know whenever I had my trial last spring a couple in the church was away they were away on vacation and they had heard I guess by word of mouth from others that what what had happened to us and so you know I had been burned seriously I, I was in terrific pain those first few days I'd say the first 48 hours just well, I didn't sleep any the first night. You couldn't sleep. Just terrific pain. And I was just confessing the word, memorizing scripture. I memorized Second Peter 1, the whole chapter that night. I said, nothing better to do. We won't get any sleep tonight, so let's just memorize the word. So I put that chapter to memory right there, Second Peter 1. It just sounded good. It was a good chapter. So I thought, we're going to memorize this tonight. It'll get my mind off the pain, because pain is pain. You know, you can be a person of faith, and you're hurting. You can feel that. So you find a way to get your mind off of that. And I said, we're going to memorize scripture tonight. So let's take a whole chapter here, 21 verses. That should take us a while. I had it in 15 minutes, so we had to find something else. I worked on the last chapter, 1 Peter, after that. But anyway, we got a letter. I think it was on uh, Saturday. Now, I had been burned on a Thursday afternoon. And, and from this couple that was gone on vacation away from the body. And so I sat down, you know, to read it. I was in the kitchen. I sat at my wife's desk in the kitchen. I was going to read her the letter and see what all they had to say. And I'm sure they'd make some comments, you know, about, well, praise the Lord, we heard what happened. So I get into it and just, well, here's what we've done. We saw this and went here. And I got to the second paragraph waiting, you know, for my name to enter into the picture. <laughs> and so they're talking about someone else and what happened to them. And so I go on to the third, I think there were four paragraphs. I got to the third one. Oh, surely my name will be here. No, it wasn't in that third paragraph. And I looked up, and then I had to turn over the back side. I looked up to my wife. They're not even saying anything about me. I knew they knew about it. They couldn't hide that. I knew that they knew about it. So I turned over on the back, fourth paragraph. I get down to the, I've still got the letter. <laughs> I get down to that last sentence. Oh, by the way. You know, oh, by the way, we heard that you were burned. Well, that's too bad. Praise the Lord. Sincerely, you know, goodbye. That was the end of it. Well, that was, about the, that was about the thrust of it. There wasn't any, well, we're believing or we're praying. It's just, oh, we heard about it. Well, praise the Lord. And I found out later, they said, we weren't concerned. Well, it's good I was concerned. <laughs> it was good somebody was concerned in that. <laughs> but I got their point. I wasn't offended. You know, you either get, I always say, you either get sympathy or you get the victory, one or the other. And if you want sympathy, you're offended with things like that. I wasn't offended. I kind of chuckled at the end. I said, well, I guess... I'm the one that taught them. I'm the one that made them like that. <laughs> so, I can't complain. It's my own fault. Nobody brings a basket of fruit around the house or something. It's my own fault. Well, the point is, it was a privilege to be able to go through that. You know, I, I hadn't had a trial in a while. Not a trial like that anyway. Not a good physical trial where I could really trust the Lord. 
because we often talk about exercising your faith. Well, it, it, it's strengthened. It's strengthened through using it. We can prove that over in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. Fruit grows. Faith has to be exercised. Hey, we don't have to prove that from Scripture. We know that from our own life, from our own experience. You have a deeper just belief in God today than you had whenever you were first converted. Amen. Your faith has grown. Your faith has grown concerning God and his power and his wisdom and his tenderness and his love and his concern and his judgment and his wrath. Amen. Your, your faith, your faith, what you believe about him in those areas has grown as you have grown in your knowledge of him and as you've grown in your experience of him. And that's exactly the way that it should be. But it'll only happen whenever we count this whole business a privilege to be experiencing. You know, I think if we ever, when someone ever gets to the place that they don't look at their trials of faith as a privilege to go through, then God may just stop giving them those trials then and just let them get right back on into the comfortable ease of the world where there are just a few bumps and ups and downs, but everything's pretty much taken care of. It's guaranteed by somebody. You know, you're tied into some institution somewhere who's going to guarantee your security and your life and your prosperity and your health. You, of course, they can't guarantee it, but you're tied into security somewhere. Or maybe you're just tied into the kind of the old, um, well, just the merry-go-round of life. You're just tied into complacency there and apathy and a lack of doing anything, neither good nor evil, just back into that old rut of nothing exciting happening. Whenever you have a trial of faith, you have something exciting that's happening in your life then. You've got something you know, that just starts your blood and your adrenaline flowing there. Amen. Where before you might have been kind of taking things easy and now, you know, it's like a lost person out there. What fear does, well, it increases your heartbeat and it increases your sensitivity, your hearing and your eyesight. All of a sudden, everything becomes heightened in you. Like there's danger around. You're hiking, backpacking in some mountain country and you hear or see a grizzly around. And all of a sudden, your senses, everything is heightened in you. Your heart pumps, and you have a rush of adrenaline. That's what faith will do for you. Whenever you're in a trial like that, you're no longer, well, praise the Lord, I believe, I believe. It's I believe, I believe, I believe. <laughs> it's experiencing what these people are experiencing, not, well, I can quote Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is substance and faith is evidence but it's really getting in the experience with both of your feet and living it. And I think if we're serving God in these latter days, we won't have to go out looking for trials. We don't have to go out looking for them, but whenever we find them, we can't turn our back on them, though. What did David do when Goliath took a step toward him? He ran, not away from him. <laughs> I got to finish the sentence, you know, for most people. They say, yeah, that's right, that's what I would have been doing, too. He ran toward him. I had to finish the sentence. When Goliath took a step toward him, David took a step, but not away. He took a step, too, toward him. I think that's a good faith principle. When the devil takes one step, you better take two. Amen. You know, sometimes all he's going to give is a roar. Sometimes the devil fights harder. Now, you don't ever know at the beginning of the trial if this is going to be a hard one or an easy one. Sometimes, what's he called in 1 Peter 5? A roaring lion. Have you ever heard the little American proverb that a dog's bark is worse than its bite? So, now, that's not always true with the devil. He is a powerful foe. Look what he did to Job. He had a bark and a bite there. But sometimes, that's all he is, is a roaring lion. Now, sometimes he devours. That's the rest of the verse there. Sometimes he attempts to devour. Sometimes all he does is roar. Every time a lion out on the African desert roars, does that mean he's going to devour? No, sometimes it's just an expression of his existence there to let the rest of the area or the clan around him know who's boss and who's king. All he does is roar. He's not after a antelope or something. He just roars. 
Sometimes that's all that it is. Amen. You know, if we really get our spiritual understanding down pat here, get our head on right as it were, then we'll understand the devil is the one in the cage, not us. He doesn't have us. He's the one who's already been defeated at the cross. Jesus dealt him a fatal blow, Genesis 3.15. Jesus was temporarily wounded. What would happen? He will crush the head of the serpent. He dealt him a fatal blow at the cross. I'll never forget a vision someone related. Uh, well, I think of two, but I'll relate one of them, maybe the other later. But I remember one in particular where I believe it was a woman who had had this vision of herself and a lion, which was representing the devil. And in between the two were bars, like on an old-fashioned jail, or I guess a modern one. It was a cage. It was a jail cell. But she was so close to it, all you could see were those three items, herself, the lion representing the devil, and what she could tell was a cage or a jail cell. And the lion was roaring. Well, I think for the typical person, if they were to back away from that, the way they would expect the whole picture to fill itself in is there the devil has that person captive, locked up in a jail cell, and he's roaring in triumph over them. Well, whenever she saw the rest of the vision, the devil was the one in the jail cell, not her. She was out. She was free. free. You see, that's how we are as Christians. We're out there free, but the devil sometimes can roar and we look at the roar and see the bars of the jail cell and what we become convinced is that we are locked up. We're not. Amen. Jesus said, I've given you power over all the power of the enemy. Amen. I've given you authority Amen. over all the authority of the enemy. Amen. He said that we could tread on serpents and scorpions. Amen. He said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Hallelujah. That was just a, a pre-experience of what was going to happen at the cross. I saw him. It, it was a demonstration, the ministry of the 70 as they went out, casting out demons. Satan's power was, was loosening then, and he was falling. And that was just a preview of what was going to happen at the cross. He said, I already see Satan as lightning. This is in Luke chapter 10. Uh, beginning with verse 18 there, I see him as lightning fall from heaven. The one in the cage is not us. It's the old devil. Who is he? He's a deceiver. He cannot tell the truth. From the beginning, we're told in John 8, 44, he abode not in the truth. He is a liar and the father of all liars. What he tells you, which is always negative, is not true. It will not happen if you believe God. Amen. It is not the way things are. Well, you don't have. Well, you are this. Well, that can't happen. Well, this won't work. That's what he says. God never tells us that. What does God say? I invite you. Ask whatever you will, and it shall be done unto you. What things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. All things, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Call unto me, and I'll answer you. Now, do you find any negative promises? Well, that'd be a contradiction of terms. A negative promise, a negative, a promise is a promise. It's a positive word that God gives us. We don't hear a negative voice from him. Where nary is heard a discouraging word. You won't hear that from God. You won't hear that from God. That comes from below. God's words are encouraging to us. They're not discouraging. They're encouraging to us. God never tells us what we can have or what we can't do. What we cannot have or cannot do but what we can. What he won't do but what he will do. The one who's in the cage is the devil. James, Peter, they both tell us, Paul tells us, Ephesians 4, to resist the devil. Don't give place to the devil. Resist him and he'll flee from you. You're not the one who's in the cage. It's the devil who's bound. He's a deceiver and he's a liar. His ministers are a duplication of him, are they not? He sends out his false ministers and they manifest the same spirit that he has. And so what is that? He is a thief. 
He comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. He comes with no positive view in mind, no positive purpose in mind, but to rob and to destroy and to kill. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. In the devil is death. In Jesus is life. He said, I am the way, the truth. I am life. And the devil is death. In Jesus is life. We're told in Hebrews chapter 2 that Jesus has destroyed him who has both the power and the fear of death. Of death. Hebrews 2. That he has destroyed both the power and the fear of death. Many people do many strange things because of the fear of death. Because of the fear of death. They'll spend all their life savings because of the fear of death. The writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus has destroyed both the power and the fear of death. As though it's not enough just to have destroyed the power of death. The power, death has no power over a Christian. Death has no power over him. Paul asked, grave, death, where is your sting? Amen. Grave, where is your victory? You don't have it anymore. Amen. Jesus, the same one who has descended, has ascended. Amen. He's stolen from the devil what, de what the devil stole from the world. He stole life and health and blessing and peace of mind and prosperity. He's stolen that from the world. He's stolen life and given us death in return. How many people he has murdered and killed through disease and automobile accidents and all types of tragedies. How many people he has stolen their life from them. But the good news is that in him, Jesus, is life. And the life is the light of men, John 1 and verse 4. That Jesus has destroyed him who has both the power and the fear. Well, we're here in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 2, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. Now look what we're told here in this verse. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. And who is the one who has the power of death? The devil. You know, I got two mailings today. It's really interesting how these two mailings were set up. One was a Christian publication, and one was just a secular journal. The Christian, and they were, it's so interesting, the Christian publication had on the front cover the testimony of a man who had been told by his doctors, there's no hope for you. You've got a couple of months, and you'll be dead. And he had a certain ailment where in a couple of months he would be dead. There's, there's no question about it. It was a heart failure, a heart disease. The same thing happened to be true. Two entirely different men, entirely different cases. But as a child, he had had rheumatic fever, which had damaged his heart. And this was 10 years earlier, and he didn't have any hope at all. And he began to get the faith message, and he began to hear that. And he totally did away with his medicine that could, you know, keep things in check. He refused to go in for surgery, and God completely healed him as a result of that. Then there was another case, came the same mailing today, just a plain secular magazine whose cover story was on the same situation, someone dying, I believe, of a heart disease or a liver disease, some internal organ there, something failing they were dying of. And they had to go through all the... Uh, the experience and the hassle, as they say, of Mayo Clinic and in and out and drugs and treatment and repairing and putting in false ones. And now they've, they've got him all stitched up and he may, you know, who knows whether he's going to die or live after this. Uh, but he may live a few more years now. The devil is the one who has the power of death. And look what happened. Look at the two cases. They were on my desk. You could set them side by side there. One, who, one man who was not delivered from either, either the power or the fear of death. And another man 
without any of the advances of medical science and technology, with no skills at all there, with a simple, just invisible faith here, chose to believe God, and he was delivered from both the power and the fear of death. I've spoken to you before of faith as being like like a sixth sense. What are our senses but ways we receive information, ways we contact the world around us through touch and sight and smell and hearing. We, we contact the environment, the world around us. We receive input and we, we, we give out output. We give things and receive things. Well, faith is like a sixth sense. You won't get any of these spiritual things we're talking about with your five senses. They're in another realm. Or to say it another way, you've heard of three dimensions. Faith is like a fourth dimension to our existence. There, there are three-dimensional objects and images. There's a fourth dimension. It can't be plotted out. It can't be mapped. It can't be located by longitude or by latitude or by uh, astronomical coordinates. It can't be located there. It is another dimension. It is a fourth dimension to our existence. Now, God means for us as his people to have this and to live this type of life. And he expects us to so much that he actually says in the word, I quoted that to you, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, Amen. don't go by those other senses. Don't go by those three dimensions. Not in the faith walk. Not in the faith walk. Not in our Christian life, we could say. Don't, don't go by those three dimensions. Don't go by those five senses. Go by that other dimension, the faith world, the spirit world, the invisible world. That's where the battles and the victories are fought and won. That's where faith is exercised. They're not in the natural world. It's in the invisible world. Don't rely on those five physical senses that we have. They can deceive. God hasn't given them to us to know him through or to get to him by. He's given us another one, a sixth sense. I think it can really be spoken of that way, that you can have your eyesight. You say, well, wait a minute. You know, other people, you can use your eyesight, or I can use mine to look at God's word, and I can, you know, gain knowledge of God that way. What about all those people who have their eyesight who read the Bible and never come to know God? Amen. What about all the heathen who have their eyesight and their emotions and their hearing and everything, and they still can't reach God through creation? He's there. He's manifesting himself. Psalm 19 says that he is. God can be known by his creation. They still don't know him. Now, they'll be without excuse because God has given them a way by which they can know him, but they're going to have to do more than just look around them. You look around and you say sunset, period. Moon, period. Instead of sunset, who made the sun? Moon, who made the moon? Stars, who flung all those stars? Who made the universe? Why am I here? What is mine? You have to start asking those questions and faith starts immediately supplying the answers in. Amen. Faith is your way of contacting God, touching God, reaching God. I think we go back to maybe the first message here. It's a bridge. It's a bridge to God. You don't know him through rational arguments. You know him through faith. By faith, we believe. Hebrews 11:3, that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And the things that we see are not made of things that do appear. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's active, that he's alive and that he's active that he's alive and that he's active in the world, Amen. that he is alive. Many people are willing to grant that. They don't want to grant that he's doing anything, that he will reward those. Or they say, well, maybe in heaven. Well, that's not the context of Hebrews 11. They got some rewards in heaven, to be sure. They were rewarded in the here and the now. That's what the whole chapter is about. They were given things now in their experiences with God. We don't approach God apart from faith. We don't live our life as Christians apart from faith. We don't know God through rational arguments. We don't reach him just through our senses if we don't have our senses in line with the word of God. So that as we use our eyes and look at scripture, we don't just see black ink on a white page. We say, this is a living epistle to me. These are the living words of the living God to me. Many people, friends, read the Bible and they just don't get anything out of it. 
They're reading with their eyesight, so are you. But as you read, as you read, you're reading also with another eyesight. Eyes of faith that can see, that can, that can believe what you're, what you're seeing there, that can believe what you're hearing. Faith comes by hearing the word. There's another sense right there, hearing. But faith comes by hearing. The hearing isn't the last thing. It's what comes by that. Faith. Faith in God. Faith in his promises. God is a mighty God. We dare not limit him with some of these, what sh the, these enemies of our faith will try to do. Unbelief just wants to almost rule God out. We can't have it both ways saying, I'll believe half of Hebrews 11.6. I'll take that bit about he is, but what about that bit business that he does? I believe that he is, but that he does? Oh, that requires something, you see. You're going to be put out on a limb, or you're going to be embarrassed if it doesn't happen, or, you know, you're going to be put in the spotlight there. I believe you have to say that God does. Anyone can say that he believes that he is. Well, a Muslim can say that. You know, it doesn't cost you anything. It'll cost you something if you don't believe in his existence. But it doesn't cost you anything. Just say, I believe God is. If you say, I believe that he does, someone might say, well, all right, what does, what does he do then? Show it to me. What did James say? I'll show you my faith by my works. You say that you can have faith and I can have works. No, James says you can't have one without the other. I'll show you my faith by my works, or I'll show you that faith works. We could paraphrase it. I'll show you that faith isn't a theoretical abstraction because God isn't. He's not a theoretical abstraction. He's a living person who wants to bless and encourage and fellowship with his covenant people. Amen. He's not a theoretical principle. He's not the universal spirit or mind. He's a living reality, a real person, a living, real being who wants us to know him and who wants to know us and who wants to fellowship with us and commune with us and bless us in our life. The only way we'll have this experience in our life is through what we're trying to teach you here, the message of faith. Now, I could have taken a written transcript of last, well, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago, the message on unbelief. I could have taken, I could take a written transcript of that, you know, get a, someone, a stenographer, to write all of that down and just come and read that to you. And you need to hear it again. Yep. These faith messages you need to hear over and over and over again. Amen. I could take the same message and come back and just read it. I hope you've heard it. But I could come back and just read it to you. it do you good again. Unbelief's an enemy. Unbelief's an enemy. And your enemy will talk you into that enemy. Unbelief. Well, I don't believe that. I don't believe God. He'll talk you into that. That's his nature, a nature of skepticism and negativism and doubt and unbelief. That's his nature. That's not God. God's a free spirit. The devil's nothing but a spirit of bondage, a spirit of lack and poverty, a spirit of disease and a spirit of bondage, a spirit of negativism. He's nothing but that. Jesus tells us that more than one place, but John 8, 44, that's enough for me right there. He's the father of anyone who could, of whom it could be said is the father of liars. Come on, that's a bad person. That is a person in the pit of bondage. Of whom it can be said he is a liar from the beginning. He's a murderer from the beginning. He never abode in the truth from the beginning. From the beginning of man's history, the devil was not in the truth. He's a liar. He's a murderer. He's a liar. He's a father of all liars. You see, we've got another part to our nature besides our physical self here. Man is made up of more than just body. Man has body and spirit, which equals soul. And in that same other dimension by which you can reach God, a spiritual type dimension, the devil can reach you. And he, 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 does it, he can minister through that area. I've said in... Well, over the years, a long time ago, maybe it was the last time I said it, but the same, if I could use this term, and since we're talking about invisible spiritual realities, you have to use metaphors to even really talk about them. It's the same mechanism that believes, that doubts. 
It's not the foot or the, or the toe or the left earlobe. It's the same mechanism, to use an, an earthly metaphor. It's the, it's the something that makes you you, that gives you the power to choose and the power of volition. The same mechanism that believes chooses not to believe. Because if we could just get into our heart, that's what faith is. And what unbelief are all about, it's a choice. No one makes you do that. No one forces you into that. You are presented certain evidences. And you choose then either to believe or not believe. The devil presents you certain alleged evidences. Why it won't work or why this can't happen. All right? That's what he'll give you. God will give you certain evidences. We call that his word here. His promises, which are the divine resources of God. They are, the, they are the very blessings for the Christian. They are his divine resources. They are the things by which all of our needs are supplied. The word of God, the promises of God. He presents us with those. And we choose. What did Moses say? Choose you this day. You choose it. Amen. Whether you want to believe God or not believe God. Whether you want to believe God and his word or believe man's word. And man, if he's opposed to God, is always agreeing with the adversary, the devil. You choose. What do you want? Will it be life or will it be death? Deuteronomy chapter 30. Will it be blessing or will it be a curse? You choose. The same mechanism that believes doubts. You're given certain evidences. You're given certain input. By the world, by friends, by me, by God, by the devil, by the Holy Spirit in your own life, through the word. However, you're given lots of input in life. Some of, those, some of that input you're given, you, you say to yourself in your mind, I don't believe that. I just don't believe that. Some of that input you say, I believe that. If a chronic liar tells you, I'll be there at 10 o'clock sharp, you got certain input there. And so you got a mechanism and you say, I choose not to believe that. Now, you've got some past experience on that one, but you say, I choose not to believe that. Well, hey, the longer we're Christians, we've got past experience that it's worth believing because it does work. Amen. This message will be continued on the following.